Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. We're going to be doing a quick and dirty deep dive into machine learning concepts for introductory product managers. If you're an experienced machine learning practitioner, this is your warning. We're just going to be covering the basics today. My name is Carl Betzler, and I'm a senior product manager at Amazon. I've been with Amazon for about two and a half years, and every day I use machine learning to help improve the Amazon shopping experience. Prior to Amazon, I worked in management consulting, helping Fortune 500 companies improve their digital strategy. If you have any questions throughout this webinar or want to reach out to me, you can find my contact information at www.carlbetzler.com. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer. All of the views and opinions expressed today are my own, and they do not reflect the views and opinions of Amazon or any of my previous employers. Now that that's out of the way, we can get into the fun stuff. But before we talk about how to use machine learning, it's important for us to understand what machine learning is. And it just so happens that one of the earliest definitions of machine learning is actually one of the clearest. Arthur Samuel, who was a pioneer of AI and worked at IBM at the time in 1959, said that uh, machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And I actually find it easiest to think about ML in the context of traditional uh, programming or classical programming. For those of you who don't have a background in computer science, uh, classical programming is actually quite simple. What you're doing is you're providing data and rules in a very specific way to teach a computer how to do something. Every time you go to a web page, open an app, or even use a calculator, what you're doing is giving the machine a specific set of instructions, which are written by a programmer to handle that specific task. If you try to do something that the computer doesn't know how to do, or there's no specific language for, then you're going to get an error and it's going to fail. Think about what happens when you go to a web page that doesn't exist. Um, the request doesn't work because there's no explicit instructions for how the computer should get there. Machine learning is a little bit different. Instead of writing specific rules, we provide the machine with data and answers to see if it can figure out what the rules uh, are that connect the two. We're gonna go through a lot of examples today, but I like to think about how Spotify can tell what song you're going to like. It has a lot of information about the different traits of various musical genres, and it has information about what you've listened to in the past and what you've added to specific playlists, even what you've specifically liked. And so it can, know what you like and intuit rules about your preferences. Now, every Machine Learning 101 course has some version of this slide, so I apologize if you've seen it before, but it's important to put all of our buzzwords into context. And the thing I want you to take away from this slide is that deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence or AI is the broad area of study. Machine learning, or ML, is the technique that's used to uh, automatically learn and apply statistical algorithms for, to teach a computer to learn. And deep learning is a very specific technique that allows a computer model to filter through layers of information to predict and classify it. Since this is an introductory course, we won't focus much on deep learning today, and we're going to zero in on machine learning concepts. Now that we have a conceptual understanding of what machine learning is, let's talk about why it's important. And I suspect that most of you already have a good understanding of this. The answer is growth. No matter what you're looking at, whether it's number of AI startups, uh, annual venture capital investment in AI startups, job openings, or AI papers published, the field of artificial intelligence is growing exponentially. The global AI market is actually expected to reach $267 billion by 2027. And already, when you look at a job board or a new startups website, you're going to see it peppered with ML buzzwords. The good news is it's relatively easy for you to learn enough about machine learning to be a successful product manager of ML products. But before we talk about what you need to know, let's talk about how we got here. So here you see a brief history of AI. When most people think about artificial intelligence, they think about the future. And I would agree that in most cases, um, the future of AI is just beginning. Um, we're very much at the beginning of the capabilities, but this is also not a new technology. 
If you've ever taken a statistics course, you're probably familiar with Thomas Bayes and Bayes' theorem, um, which was published in 1763 and really laid the foundation for the field of modern statistics and artificial intelligence. In 1950, we have another famous example when Alan Turing, who you probably know um, as a, uh, a code breaker during World War II, decrypted German messages proposed a learning machine and is considered by many to be the father of uh, artificial intelligence and theoretical computer science. In 1956, the term artificial intelligence was first used and coined by John McCarthy, who was an MIT professor at the time. And then since we've had a number of innovations, including the nearest neighbor algorithm in 1967, back propagation in 1986, and the support vector machines in 1995. Fast forward to modern day and we have a couple of my favorite innovations and you tend to see innovations almost every day in artificial intelligence these days. The first is in 2016, Google's AI AlphaGo beat humans at the game Go. If you're not familiar with the game Go, uh, it has no dominant heuristics. It's very complex and it's very hard to program. So this was considered a huge milestone in the field of artificial intelligence. And just last year, it's not on the slide, but uh, OpenAI published GPT-3, which is a scary good text generation uh, artificial intelligence, can actually simulate the style of specific writers. And it's actually published via open source API. So if you have a chance and you're ever curious, I encourage you to go check it out and see what it can do. With so much investment flowing into artificial intelligence, it's easy to think that it can solve any problem, but the truth is it solves some problems very well and others very poorly. A few of the best use cases are listed here. Um, the first one we're gonna cover is ranking, which is an algorithm designed to help users find the most relevant thing. The classic example is search. And so think about Google and how it's able to determine what you're looking for based on just a few words typed into a search bar. The next is recommendation, and these algorithms are pretty common today. Um, one of the best and widely considered the gold standard is Netflix. Um, basically what it does is it's trying to give users the thing that it's most interested in. And if you've ever gotten caught binging Netflix and who hasn't, um, you can attest to how good Netflix's recommendation engine is. The third is classification. Uh, classification is when we want to label or group items, and facial recognition is a great example of this. You can see here Facebook's facial recognition at work. It can see an image of you and determine that it is you and differentiate you from your friends or from others. Uh, if you select the not me button that you can see pictured here as well, um, the computer will learn and adjust its learning algorithm to then change the way it thinks of you. Um, so really interesting work from Facebook on classification. Next is regression. Uh, regression is when we want to predict a numerical value. It can be useful for a variety of different things. Here uh, at Amazon, we like to use it to um, predict how much inventory to order so that a specific product doesn't run out. But it can also be used for things like pricing. Fifth is clustering. Uh, and this is when we wanna put similar things together. Now, uh, here I have an example of Spotify and Spotify uses a lot of different machine learning techniques, but the one I wanna focus on here is how it is able to group songs according to genres or moods. You can literally plug anything into Spotify and it will have music for it. Just last weekend, I was snowboarding and typed snowboarding into Spotify and it came up with a playlist that was specific to what people wanna to listen to when they're snowboarding. Um, so it's able to put these combinations of music together um, these playlists together through clustering. And last but not least, we have anomaly detection. And this is when we want to find out uncommon things in the data. My favorite example is also a common one. It's when you get a fraud notice from your bank or credit card. Um, if you've ever been shopping and received an alert that looks like this one, uh, asking if you made a certain purchase, you've tricked, you tripped your bank's anomaly detection model based on your behavior, and it's trying to confirm um, that the person making the purchase is you. Within machine learning and within all of those different types of problems that we covered, there's two specific classes of problems, supervised and unsupervised learning. When you see the term supervised learning, what I want you to think about is labels. You feed labeled data into a computer 
so that it can learn rules to determine an outcome. The classic example is actually shown here. If you show a computer a bunch of pictures of a dog and tell them that, tell the computer that it's a dog, then you tell the computer a, a number of other pictures or a cat, it will then be able to uh, try to figure out what some of the differences are. Maybe it learns that cats typically have longer whiskers and dogs tend to have floppier ears. Based on those rules that the computer learns, you can then show it a new picture of a dog or cat, and it should be able to classify which animal it is. In an unsupervised model, um, the way it learns is actually quite different. We do not feed in correctly labeled data. The model itself learns the underlying structure of the data and groups uh, or structures based on what we've fed in. One important note about unsupervised learning is that it can be a little bit of a black box. We don't understand why these patterns exist or why the model is grouping in that particular way, but the computer can still really intuit some really interesting, interesting facts. So again, think about supervised learning, think about labels. We're gonna focus mostly on supervised learning today. So within supervised learning, there are two major types of problems, regression and classification. And we already talked a little bit about examples of each of these. In a regression problem, we're trying to predict a quantity or numeric value. If you've ever taken a statistics course or used Excel, you may already be familiar with this. Essentially, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fit a line to the data. Um, so you can see a graphical representation here. We have a number of data points and we're trying to figure out what best represents that data. Some types include linear regression, K nearest neighbor, neural nets, and trees. You don't need to know too much about those different types, um, but it's important to know they exist. And if you ever want to take some follow-up courses, um, it's good to dive into how each of them work. The second type of problem is a classification problem. In, classific uh, in classification, excuse me, instead of trying to predict a continuous variable, we are trying to place items into discrete categories. Going back to the cats and dogs example, uh, we have uh, some cats and some dogs, and we're trying to figure out which is which. That is very much a classification problem. Uh, if you want a more, a more advanced example, you can think about facial recognition. And some types include K nearest neighbor, neural net, trees, support vector machines, and logistic regression, where you're trying to get to a more binary uh, response. Which of something is that example? Within supervised learning, um, it's important to know what types of metrics you want to track. As a product manager, you're likely going to be working with a team of data or research scientists uh, to define the problem and determine the appropriate machine learning technique to use. You can and should uh, use their expertise whenever possible. Um, these are people who typically have a background in advanced statistics, often a master's degree or a PhD. So it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to learn enough about machine learning to be able to actually complete these models. But it is extremely helpful to understand your model's metrics so you can make key decisions about the product, uh, about how it's performing, whether to launch, and when to change course if need be. There are lots of ways to measure your models, and you should start to think about them pretty much as soon as you start conceptualizing your product. Let's consider the problems we've discussed before, regression and classification. Uh, within regression, we, as, as we mentioned, we're predicting a numeric value. Uh, and so because that value is quantitative, we can look at the distance between our prediction and the actual value through metrics like root mean squared error or R squared. Classification is quite different. Uh, we're not predicting a quantitative value. In this case, it's binary, but it can be multi-classification multi as well. And so we can't look at distance of predictions. Instead, we look at metrics like accuracy, precision, and recall to determine whether our model's right and how often it is right. Accuracy is one I want to cover here, um, which is the total number of uh, the total correct predictions over the total number of predictions. And it can be a very useful metric, but it also has some flaws. If you look at this example, it's a bit imbalanced. Um, we can see lots of these dark blue circles and only three light blue triangles. Uh, we could just pick a model that predicts that everything in this graph that's plotted is a dark blue circle, and it would still give us 86% accuracy, which is not a bad metric. 
But that's not, not actually that helpful because we're not differentiating between the light blue triangles and the dark blue circles. So as a result, we wanna look at things like precision and recall. This is a confusion matrix and it helps us try to figure out our models precision and recall. Now, uh, getting into our example, let's, let's look at this graph in a little bit more detail. And let's say our model is trying to predict the dark blue circles and it shows results by covering, uh, basically results are covered by this green circle. Now precision is looking at the quality of our predictions and specifically it's looking at the number of true predictions over uh, all true predictions. In this case, if we go back to the previous slide, you can see that of the, its predictions, of its true predictions, it's predicting 10 out of 11. So pretty good, it's 91% accurate. Recall is a little bit different. With recall, we're looking at the quantity of predictions. It's defined as the number of correct true predictions over all true cases. In this case, again, going back a couple slides, you can see it is, though it is very precise, it is only predicting 10 out of 18, so 56%, which is not as good. One of the most common things I do as a product manager at Amazon is analyze the trade-offs between precision and recall for our models. And there are situations where you wanna prioritize one over the other. For a timely example, if you are designing a test for COVID-19 and wanna minimize spread, you would wanna maximize recall so you can inform as many people that they potentially have COVID and want to contain the spread, even if it results in a few false positives. On the other hand, if you're trying to build a banking app that determines credit risk or default risk, you would want a high precision model because you wouldn't wanna turn away customers uh, for a loan if they are not actually a significant credit risk. So there are times where you wanna optimize for both. And this is one of the most important lessons you can learn as a product manager. So we've talked about some of the key ones, um, accuracy, precision, and recall. There are a ton of other ways to measure your metrics. Um, and you can track the, them depending on what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, they include logarithmic loss, area under the ROC curve, mean absolute error, and many, many others. This is a place where you probably want to defer to your machine learning experts um, and try to understand exactly what you should be tracking to achieve the intended business result. One of the most common problems I see product managers and even entire companies make is that they try to shoehorn ML into every one of their solutions. It's easy to understand why uh, they see the investment and probably can get some initial investment if they tried to make it a machine learning based uh, solution. But as I mentioned earlier, there are some problems that machine learning can solve very well, and there are some that it doesn't solve all too well. Uh, it's important to consider several major factors, first about your problem, and second about your data set before you decide to use machine learning. First and foremost, you, before you do anything, you should consider your problem. If it can be solved by simple rules, then classical programming is a better solution. It will be significantly less complex and significantly faster to build. If you require 100% accuracy, machine learning is also not for you. Uh, it's virtually impossible to have a machine that can predict uh, a certain result with 100% accuracy. If you need to be able to interpret the results, this is another solution where machine learning is probably not for you. In a lot of cases, you're not gonna be able to tell why a machine made a specific decision. You are just going to know that decision. And finally, if you need a solution that can, uh, that can adapt, uh, if you don't need a solution that can adapt to new data, um, then you should reconsider using machine learning as well. Um, all of this is to say that when you can build a simpler solution, you absolutely should. It will save you time and money in the long run. Now, if your problem meets all of these requirements, then it's time to consider your data. To build an effective machine learning model, you need access to a large, secure, relevant, and unbiased data set. One of the most common mistakes when building ML products is a garbage in, garbage out type scenario. This is when your data is not high quality and you try to train a model on it. And in that scenario, you're not gonna be able to trust any of the insights because the data itself is flawed. And so the insights the computer gleans from it are also flawed. 
Now let's say you have a ML worthy problem and flawless data. How do you go about launching an ML product? Well, this sounds like a simple solution, but it's uh, really the same way you launch any other product. What I mean by this is that an ML solution requires the same level of analysis and scrutiny that another product would require. And you cannot treat machine learning as some kind of a magic potion to make your product work well or be adopted by millions of people. The best advice is to work backwards from the customer. Who's going to use your product? Uh, what problem are they having? How will your product solve that problem? Uh, what types of benefits can you deliver? When you have the answers to these types of questions, uh, it's time to prove that you know what you're talking about. So to do that, we like to use data and to try to understand uh, exactly how you're going to solve the problem. Uh, so before you actually build anything, you wanna research your customers as much as possible, gather data that shows that they will use your product and how, to, how it will resolve their problems. And you wanna design actionable mockups that show the user experience. The key here is to focus on building an awesome product that your users will love that just happens to be based in machine learning. Instead of building a machine learning product that is, user, uh, that is not user focused and that nobody wants to use. Finally, once you have a clear understanding of what you wanna build and can back your assumptions up with data, it's time to build a minimum lovable product or an MLP. Now, uh, an MLP is essentially, you may have heard of it before, it's the most bare bones version of your product that your customers are still going to love. So it's stripped of most of its bells and whistles. At this point, you have a key question to answer. Is it possible to build a minimum lovable product without machine learning? And if it is, then you should absolutely do that. It's a quicker, simpler solution, and you can always go back later and add incremental value with machine learning. If you cannot build the MLP without ML, then uh, it's important to engage your scientists and tech teams as soon as possible. Uh, there are a lot of different factors that go into building a machine learning based product and engaging these experts early will help you try to, to catch some of those before they end up costing extra work later on. One of the key examples is uh, at Amazon is with latency. Um, so if you go and build the model first, you have a prototype of the model and then the model doesn't fit into uh, the requirements for how quickly we need something to load on a web page or how quickly we need to respond, then you need to redesign the model from scratch. If you were to engage your science and tech teams early, you could potentially reduce the likelihood of that happening. Before we close things out, I leave you with some best practices. First and foremost, um, you're, you're already here doing a, uh, a learning course in your free time on machine learning. I would encourage you to continue that spirit of uh, experimentation. Some of the best products that I've worked on at Amazon have come from uh, random freeform brainstorm sessions with our data science and engineering teams. Um, this kind of experimentation really helps you push the limits of uh, the individual scope of work that you're working on, and it can be really exciting. Next is to think backwards from the customer, which is always key advice for any product manager, um, but it really will prevent you from our first don't, which is using ML without an appropriate reason. Think about building quality products that use ML, not about building machine learning, -based pro uh, machine learning first products, excuse me. Next is to ask for advice whenever you need it from scientists, machine learning experts, other product managers. Um, this will really help you fall into some, uh, pr help prevent you from falling into some common pitfalls and uh, will really improve your knowledge of machine learning very, very quickly. And similarly, engage your tech teams early and often. I talked a little bit about things that can happen when you don't do this, um, but it will ultimately save you a headache later on. When it comes to don'ts, don't use ML without an appropriate reason. Don't forget to solve the problem. These are common things that can happen when you don't think backwards from the customer. So make sure that you're consistently focusing on good product design. And then the other one is make sure that you vet your data. Um, don't launch with bad data because you may uh, have anomalous values that are skewing it. You may have situations where um, you're not getting the results that you think you are. And so working with experts is a good way to mitigate that. Finally, uh, I hope you have a good preliminary understanding of what machine learning is, what problems it can solve, and how to use it. 
I hope this was a helpful primer on ML and you're now excited to dive in further and uh, you at least know enough to at least um, start feeling a little bit dangerous uh, when it comes to product management and these types of skills. This is a very exciting field, but even with its insane funding and growth, uh, it still feels very early stages and it needs people like you to help unlock its potential. If you have any questions, feel free to find my contact information at carlbetzler.com or find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thanks so much.